All right, guys. So, welcome to my live stream today for a little knife chat. Let me see if I can bring up bring up my uh, screen. Let's see. Home. Boop, boop, boop. So we're gonna give everybody a few minutes, and then I'll do a little introduction, talk about what we're gonna talk about today, show you some of my knives, and go through. Technical difficulties, hold on one second. All right, I know you're all here. Um, Theo, how's it going? I see you. Give me ones here. Hello from Germany. Hey, how's it going, guys? All right, so, sorry. I'm trying to get my computer to work right now. It doesn't want to take the internet hotspot from my phone. Let's try again. Come on. All right, well, either way, I'm going to start. Um, I won't be able to see your comments right now until I get this up and running. It shouldn't take very long, so hopefully we'll get that going soon. Um, but welcome, guys. I know it's been kind of a while since we put up any videos, but I did want to just kind of... Um, I want to do a live stream because we've been doing stuff. Um, there's, for some reasons, another reason things haven't come out quite as soon as we wanted to. But either way, we wanted to make sure that uh, we put some content out there. And I've been wanting to kind of talk to you guys about the knives that I make. Um, and show you kind of a progression of where I started many years ago to kind of what I'm doing now. Now there are a lot of, um, you know, knife makers and things out there in the world that don't really want to show you their early stuff because then it shows the mistakes and it's not kind of the best of what they can do. Um, and I completely understand that because we want to show the best that we can be, the best that we can do. Um, so, you know, for that reason, um, you don't really see what people have done in the past. Uh, one of the cool things about you guys following along with my journey through YouTube so far is that you've seen me make some of my stuff over the years. Um, one of the ones I don't have with me is the neck knife. That was kind of one of the earlier ones. I have um, the very first knife video. The very first video we did on this channel was taking an old file and turning it into a knife, which was a great video. Um, and that it turned out really good, and that was a fun knife, and it, it was I'm really happy with it. And my wife so uses it's actually in her car, um, so I didn't have it here to show you guys. But um, I do have a lot of knives that I've made over the years, and I kind of wanted to show you all those knives and talk to you a little bit about it. Um, I'm still having technical difficulties, so I don't have um, my YouTube up. I think I'm just going to try to. I'm just going to restart the computer. So that'll take a minute. Um, so uh, my brother is not here, but he is watching. So if you guys see comments coming through, um, those are from him. So if you have specific questions about the channel um, or about what's coming up, you can ask those questions in the live stream. And until I have my computer back up and running and everything hooked up so I can actually see your comments, um, Devin will do his best to answer those questions. Let me just double check real quick. Okay, looks like we are still good to go. All right, good. So, while I'm waiting for that, I want to talk a little bit. So, um, my knife making journey began in college. So I had, uh, had a great class. It was kind of a site-specific installation class. Um, and for the class, uh, we, had, we would go to different places and we'd see art and sculptures and you know, things that were built in a specific place that were specific to that place. So you might have some type of sculpture that's in a sculpture garden out front of a building. And that, was, that sculpture was made specifically for that building. So I took that class uh, and one of the things that I was doing for that class was I was making some Native American inspired blankets then I was cutting those up and hanging them up in trees so it kind of as like a, almost like a canopy like a little umbrella up in the tree but it would be specific for a place because it would have, it would have been a pattern that was done by maybe the Algonquin or the Iroquois uh, Indians that are native to this that would have been native to this area this eastern woodlands area I'm in Maryland um, on the east coast of the USA so uh, I was doing patterns based off of that that were then getting hung in trees. So it's kind of this idea that maybe, you know, different tribes would be hanging patterns in different trees that might kind of 
uh, set up barriers maybe between their different tribal lands. So, you know, warring tribes would be like, you know, hang up your patterns in the tree, kind of like throwing uh, tennis shoes over t uh, phone lines in cities. Um, so I was doing that and I've always loved, uh, I've loved, you know, Native American culture and I've always loved uh, the history behind our country and the Native Americans and their way of life and their respect for the land and tools and people and animals. Um, so because of that, uh, my teacher at the time suggested that I read a book by Tom Brown called The Tracker. Now, Tom Brown um, lived in New Jersey. He's still alive. He, he lives in, the, in New Jersey. He was raised right on the edge of the Pine Barrens. And if you're not familiar with New Jersey, there's a large, you know, hundreds of square acres um, of undeveloped land. They're called the Pine Barrens. It's kind of marshy and piney um, and very woodsy. So he lived right on the edge of the Pine Barrens um, and he always considered it his backyard. So this is hundreds of thousands of acres of land that was untouched. Uh, he and his friend grew up there. His friend's grandfather uh, was an Apache Native American. So he uh, trained them in all these ways of tracking and stalking and living uh, off the land. So she suggested that I get that book. So I got the book from the library, started reading it in my apartment downtown Baltimore when I was going to school at Micah. And um, I got about maybe a third of the way through nonstop. I loved it. It was awesome. It was completely what I wanted to do. It was like, like, just like what I was as a kid, running around the woods, bows and arrows, you know, making spears and sticks and making forts and things. And um, so... I got the book, read about a third of it, and then had to go out into the woods. So I went out into the woods, read the rest of the book, you know, all pretty much in one day. It was super awesome. It was pretty life-changing. I, you know, it made a big effect on me on the way I kind of see the world and the way I do things. And so at the time, this is all coming back to the story of why I got into knife making. Um, I looked up Tom Brown and I started to look around and found out about the tracker knife that he was making. So he made a, a knife called the tracker knife. Now this was my version of something similar. I bought this at whatever yard sale or whatever like, you know, crappy um, store that had knives. So this was a knife that I thought was kind of cool, kind of remind me of what the tracker knife was. It's not exactly the same thing, but um, it was just a cool knife that I really liked. It has like the gut hook, looked really cool, nice and big. And so I took it, took it back to my apartment. I took off the plastic handle that was on it. It has these kind of screw in, almost like Corby bolts inside the handle. Took those out and replaced it with this wooden handle, which is nice and clunky. It doesn't fit up perfectly, but I did this all with hand tools, gave my little finger grooves. And this was kind of my first foray into knife making. That was my, maybe my sophomore year of of college. So that was my first knife. That was one of my first knives. Now I didn't actually make that knife. I just took a blank and I put a handle on it, but that was my kind of first foray into it. I did make the sheath, which again was one of my first kind of forays into sheath making as well. Um, this is a side draw sheath. So this would go on the small of your back like so. And then it has a thumb, has a little um, spot where you can secure it and then you can un unsecure it with your thumb in one hand and you know, open up and pull the knife out from the back. And you can re-secure it the same way. So that was kind of, you know, I thought that's pretty cool. Like if I could do something like this, then it kind of opened up what knife making was to me. Uh, so I started searching around for a few more things. Like what do I do? Um, you know, how do I make a knife? I wanted to make a better knife than this um, I liked that knife, but I realized obviously it was too big. It wasn't really like something I could take backpacking or, um, you know, it, it's just too, too big, too clunky. It wasn't purpose built. Like I wanted a knife that I could use for camping and backpacking that would work really well um, and would be the right size, uh, not too big. I realized I needed a little bit lighter um, and it had to have, you know, a good edge, a little bit of a belly, maybe a drop point for strength, a few things like that. So I started looking up what I could make. Um, on my own because I obviously at the time I was in college didn't really have any money I started looking at the, I realized that a lot of the really nice ones that I liked were pretty expensive I didn't know about Mora and I didn't know about some of the cheaper brands at the time um, so I started looking up 
how to make knives. I've always been someone who makes my own things. I've, loved, I've always loved making things. Um, so I looked up how to make a knife. And I started looking up easy ways, something that I could do that I didn't have to do heat treating, I didn't have to do forging. I didn't really have the tools to grind or shape all that much. <coughs> so uh, one of the things that came up to me was making knives out of a circular saw blade. Uh, let me check real quick. Hold on one second. Let's see. <coughs> tracker by John Brown. Tom Brown. Tom Brown is the tracker. All right, let's try again. Let's see if we got this. Okay. Connect. All right. We might be back in business. Okay. So here we go. All right, left you guys hanging. All right, I finally might be good to go. Skip this. Ah, okay, so yeah, Tom Brown tracker. All right, here we are. All right, we got, look at everybody's here. John Casey, Mr. Moon, Derek O'Hara, Housework. What's up, man? Brian, appreciate you being here. Okay, so I'm back on. How do I look, guys? Everybody, I'm okay? I think we're good to go. Now I can see, I can see your comments, so I'm going to try to, um, let's see, the other draw. Okay, da -da 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 -da. Okay, so I decided to try my hand at making a knife out of a circular saw blade. Now this isn't the very first one I did, I don't think, but this is one of the, one of the close, close to one of the first ones. Now, I wanted a neck knife, something I could hang around my neck, so I made this little sheath. It's tied a little tighter now because I hang it shorter in my shop. Um, but <clears throat> there's the knife, kind of a small, I wanted something I'd have like, you know, something somewhere I could push with my thumb. Um, didn't have to be a very big handle. It tapers from the end from the end to the, you know, to the Ricasso transition. Um, and just a great little knife. I did a Scandi grind on it, and this was made completely by hand, um, except for I cut out the shape with a Dremel. So I had a Dremel at the time, cut out my shape from a circular saw blade, and then finished the shape with a file, just a regular file and then did all the bevel grinding with the file. You can see it's kind of rusty now, but it still holds an okay edge. I mean, circular saw blades aren't the best, but they work. You know, that's the point is that they're already, they've already been heat treated somewhat. So if you can be careful when you're cutting them out, um, then, you know, you don't have to worry too much about, you know, you don't have to worry about heat treating or tempering afterward. So that was my first one. Um, and then I, want, I did want like a belt knife again for backpacking. So I made this one. It was just like a simple design, drop point, you know, even curve, round at the end, three brass pins holding everything together. And this is just brass rod that I was actually peening over. So this was using Bubinga um, and peening over my brass rod, trying to keep my plunge lines even on both sides, which was tricky. Um, you know, keep a nice shape, but something that would work well and relatively small. This is probably about, you know, three and three quarter to four inch blade. Um, <clears throat> all right, let's see. So, find the circular saw blades thicker, rugged enough. Uh, JS Beams Beam Foot says, Do I find the circular saws thick or rugged enough? Uh, these were made out of regular circular saw blades that I was finding at the time. They're probably, um, I would say maybe three sixteenths, so they're a little bit less than an eighth. Um, was that so you know and these have been fine i mean they're rigid you know they have a little bit of flex but they're plenty tough i mean i've used um thicker saw blades since then and i'll talk about that but that was just a standard circular saw blade and it worked great at the time i also made this sheath this is kind of my first attempt at just a regular um straight pocket sheath with you know belt loop all in one and this i know this blade is out there it's not not my design but at the time um I, had, I was looking at different sheath designs and they all had an additional belt loop attached in the back. I didn't really like that, so I kind of started to play around with making it all one piece and that's what this was. This is my first attempt at that. Um, so again, that's, that was kind of my, 
maybe second knife that I ever made. Uh, then I realized I might want a little bit bigger, so I made basically the same design in the next size up. So this is like a five and a half inch, maybe five and a half inch blade, four inch handle. Um, and it was okay, you know, I liked it having a little bit bigger. I was able to baton wood with it, which I wanted to do. Um, you know, just kind of getting a little bit better, basically the same design as my small one, but just a little bit more blade. <clears throat> so you can see both blades, um, same design basically with more blade. Um, and it's funny because over the years I've kind of started liking shorter and shorter blades, but at the time I thought I wanted a little bit bigger blade. And even this, this is also made with a blade that's just under an eighth um, and still plenty strong, plenty, I've never had any problem with this feeling like it wasn't strong enough or thick enough. Um, made this sheath as well and then kind of discovered um, ferro rods or, you know, um, like fire steels. And that's just kind of attached to the back there. So that way it'd always be with me when I was using that. And I used that for a couple years backpacking, used it off and on, it, was, it worked great. Um, so then, so I did a few more um, knives. Let me, I forgot to do one thing while we started. And that was to open up a beer and say cheers to everybody because it is five o'clock. It's actually 5.17 now on the East Coast. So cheers, happy Tuesday. And uh, I, th I hope you guys are all enjoying your time. All right. So here we go. Let's see. Full, let's see. Uh, let me answer a couple questions. So consider making broadheads for longbows. Uh, I thought about it. There's a few different ways you can make broadheads. I mean, there are people who make broadheads out of old, um, you know, old spoons hammered flat. Uh, if you want to have an actual broadhead with a... Uh, a, you know, a shaft or a collar attached to it, that's a little bit different. You have to have kind of a tube steel, which then you attach to the broadhead. So there's a few things like that that would be a little bit trickier. But um, you could definitely do, uh, you know, a spoon carved into a broadhead shape, basically, and then you have um, the tang would be the spoon part, and you would just split your the top of your arrow and then wrap that tight. That would work. Uh, no rain drops on the laptop, but thank you. <laughs> It's not raining yet. I don't think it's gonna rain. We'll see, hopefully not. Um, planning on, all right, so Brendan Jordan says, I'm planning on trying to make my own knife. Would I be better with a full range to start? Um, full, are you, uh, Brendan, is that question, would you be better to do a full tang to start with? I think, is that what you're trying to say, full tang or partial tang? Let me know. All right, um, so, okay, so let me move on. So I made a couple circular saw blade knives. I made an Ulu for my wife. Yes, all right. Uh, this is an Ulu, and Ulu is like a um, uh, Alaskan or, you know, um, Inuit, Native American, like ca Canadian Native American style knife they use for cooking, um, you know, like skinning animals, chopping food. It's just an all around utility knife. And my wife wanted one for basically for like chopping and cutting up nuts and fruit and stuff like that. So that's what this one's for. So that turned out pretty good. Um, you can see I was still trying to uh, get my tangs to go through nice, I mean my pins to go through nicely without chipping. This one chipped out a little bit on both sides. There's like kind of a space there. So still trying to get a really clean hole um, and then put, it, put the pins through and peen them over. Um, I prefer, with regular pins, um, just a full, a pin that goes all the way through to not pin those pins over anymore. Now I know that that makes a mechanical hold and so it like actually holds the scales together, but I've just found that it's, it's not, I can't get a consistent size or shape. The brass likes to split. Um, for what I use, um, you know, running a pin through, using epoxy, clamping everything together, getting pins on the epoxy, and, you know, making sure you put lots of holes and uh, texture on your blade and on your wood, it works great. I haven't had any of my handles come loose in all the years. Even my original ones that I didn't use anything for, these, these didn't have, um, these weren't peened over, and this is, you know, probably uh, 15 years old now, and it has, it's just as tight as it was when I first made it. All right, so let's see what we got. <clears throat> oh man. 
and make sure I'm all the way at the bottom for my comments. So hi everybody. Um, okay. So go back to um, Brendan Jordan. Uh, I would suggest doing a full tang. Um, I just think I think it's easier to get a nicer looking knife. Um, you have to be really careful and really clean with your um, whatever you're using as your bolster. So um, I'll jump ahead a little bit. So because to answer that question, so you guys might have seen this. I made this knife on the channel. This is the hidden tang knife made out of a file. Um, when you when you're doing a hidden tang knife, you have to do you don't have to, but the idea is that you you have a tang, you have your full knife, and then you have a tang that's inside. So it's not a full tang like this, something like this, where the the shape of the handle is the full shape of the knife all the way around. That's full tang. Where hidden tang, it's inside. It's basically you you're making a hole inside your handle material, and then you know bedding your tang inside, gluing it in and putting it in. Now I love hidden tangs, but um, I would say it's a little bit trickier to get you know a really clean, tight edge around your blade. So where your tang goes into your handle, you have to be really clean and get a really tight fit so you don't see a hole there. Now as a beginner knife maker, uh, I would say do what you can to avoid those things that you really have to get good at, like that. Because a gap there or a hole or like where things that don't look clean or not crisp are what are a very um, obvious sign of a beginner knife maker. Not that you know you don't want to hide the fact that you're a beginner knife maker, but you want to try to avoid those things. So I would say work on getting really clean fit ups with a, with a full tang knife first, because then all you have to worry about is getting everything clean, getting your scales flat, um, you know, getting them as flat as possible, getting your knife tang flat, and then clamping everything and running your pins through, and you, get a, you could get a really clean, um, you know, ricasso area. So that's the area between the handle and the blade. Now, a trick for knife makers that you'll you'll hear often is that when knife makers uh, make a knife when they're doing a full tang or you know scales like this on a full tang knife, you finish this front edge. The front edge that you're gonna that's gonna be clamped and it's gonna be facing forward. You want to finish that edge completely before you glue your handles on, so that way you don't have to worry about going in and sanding here and running the rest of scratching your blade after you've already uh, put your handles on. So my suggestion for newer knife makers is to do full tang handles knife first. They're going to be stronger too. You know, you don't have to worry about it like not setting up well or not gluing and not holding well. You know, these, you know, you're not, you're going to see if your handle is going to come off. It's going to come off, but it's not actually going to come out completely and fall out while you're using it. If a handle scale pops off and you're out in the bush and you're camping, you can still use it. It'll still work. All right, let's see. Duh, 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 duh. Holzinger Fly Shop says, loves your channel, it's helped me a lot. Made three knives so far and just bought some leather. Gonna try my hand at making a sheath now. Awesome, that's great. Um, Warfar A says, what about wood pins? Uh, you could use wood pins. I mean, it's, um, you know, I, I guess people use like Micarta um, and G10, they'll, they'll use it for pins. Um, I've never actually seen anyone use wood pins, but you know I think you're basically you want to make a connection between both scales. So you want to have something that runs from one scale to the other. It goes through the tang, um, and that's why we use pins. And you know, metal pins will go through clean and fill up your hole really well. Um, again, you just want to use something that's going to look nice and be clean and not have any gaps on the outside, which is which is tricky with anything that's softer um, than like a nice piece of brass or or aluminum or stainless steel. But, you know, I don't see why you couldn't use wood pins. I mean, it's all gluing together. It's not going to be as strong as metal, but it could work. Uh, let's see. Hi, Bets. How's it going? Walter. All right. Can you maybe do a video showing how you peen a pin correctly? Um, I could, but like I said earlier, um, a lot of my pins end up kind of getting little cracks around the end. Maybe that was just like the brass, the bronze that I was using was not great. Um, you know, but uh, yeah, I basically just kind of glued everything up, ran it all through, and then I'd cut them off, you know, maybe a, a 16th, 
maybe not even a sixteenth. So I had a little bit proud. And then just using a ball peen hammer, use the round end of a ball peen hammer. You're just tapping it and moving around. So you're not tapping right in the middle, you're tapping around the sides, the sides in the middle and the sides. You gotta keep working your way around until that kind of, um, that, you know, that pin kind of splays out and turns into a little rounded pin. All right. Okay, so um, let me see, let me see, where were we? So I made the Ulu, um, you know, and that was kind of the range of my first knives that I was making. Those are all made out of circular saw blades. So I wanted to start getting into some heat treating and making knives, being able to anneal and get steel and things. So I found a great video series. This was, I forget how many years ago now, but probably I'd say uh, 2000 and Maybe, I don't even remember. <laughs> but this might have been maybe five years ago, six years ago, I started really getting into it. Um, so maybe like 2012, 2013, something like that. I, um, I found the video series by a guy who called himself Green Pete. And he did a whole video series, British guy, on making a knife from a file. So taking an old metal file and making a knife. What's up from Georgia? Hello, Logan. How's it going? Uh, what kind of teacher? I'm an architecture teacher. Architecture and 3D design for Baltimore Design School in Baltimore City. Um, so I followed, I watched his video and followed along and made two knives. I made one for myself and one for my brother-in-law. And this is that knife. So... I kind of had determined a few things that I wanted, a few different shapes. I knew I still wanted a drop point. Um, I liked a kind of um, a taller flat grind, so I wasn't super familiar with Scandi grind. I liked a taller grind. I wanted to leave some of the file work behind because I thought that looked really cool and it shows the history of the blade, which I still love. Um, and, you know, pretty much a centered point to be able to use it as like a drill to drill out for a fire, you know, for a, um, a bow drill or like a, a stick drill to start a fire. Um, brass pins. Um, I left a lot of the file marks on the edge, put in some details. Um, and I ran through the process of putting this into what uh, was an old wok that I heated up, put a bunch of charcoal into a wok, drilled some holes out from the bottom, and ran a uh, hair dryer into a pipe, which ran underground and up into the wok, which was half, kind of half buried in dirt. And that was my forge at the time. So I heated up the steel in there. Um, that was after, after I annealed it. So I followed Green Pete's um, way to anneal it, which is the way I did um, the first knife that I did for the video for this whole the YouTube channel, which was basically putting it into a fire, getting that fire roaring hot, burning it really hot with lots of small sticks, lots of stuff burning really hot in the coals for a good solid hour, and then letting everything burn down and slowly cool down. So it annealed the files enough that I could work with them. Um, so then I made my forge, or I, I you know took these took the knife, shaped it out, ground all my bevels. Um, got it all to the shape I wanted it, and then I heat treated it in my wok forge. So I heated it up to red hot, kind of kept, kept it cherry red for a few minutes in and out of the forge to make sure it looked even, and then quenched it in canola oil. And it worked great. <laughs> Bowie or Bowie? Uh, let's see. <clears throat> Theo Kleiman says, what's my favorite blade shape? Um, I think my favorite kind of all in all blade shape. The thing that I keep going back to is just the Puko style knife. So um, just the slightest bit of drop point, maybe mostly it's usually some, a lot of times it's just a flat back. Um, so the spine will be flat and you have a nice belly that curves up, not super long, fairly simple. I just keep, I keep going back to more, I keep getting more and more simple on my, um, you know, for, for camping knives and bushcraft knives. But I like lots of different shapes. Um, you know, I, I'm always drawn to different ones. I follow lots of different people on Instagram, and I watch them all, and it's all just, you know, candy for the eye when you're a knife maker. Um, how do you get a flat blade if you don't have a grinder? So uh, Luca asks, how can I get a flat blade if I don't have a grinder? Um, what you can do is you take your, your knife. This is one I'm working on. I'll talk about this one a little bit later but uh, take a piece of sandpaper and put it on the flattest surface you have. Put the knife flat down on that surface with the sandpaper and just move it straight forward and back. 
pushing straight down on a flat surface. Um, one of the things I've done, and actually what I use for a flat surface, I didn't buy um, like a surface stone yet, like a, an actual milled stone for a flat, you know, flat grinding, which is a great thing to have, but you can use a piece of glass if you have a nice piece of glass. Glass is really flat, um, a small piece of glass, or I picked up, you know, single, um, ceramic tiles, like a 12 by 12 floor tile from, you know, different places where you can buy individual tiles. I got one from a um, Habitat for Humanity Restore um, where I was able to buy one tile. It was like $1.25 for that tile. It's 12 by 12, you know, maybe a quarter inch thick, so not super heavy, but nice and flat. Put your, put your sandpaper down, put it down on it, and just go straight back and forth. Get it as flat as you can. And take a look at your surface. Um, you can also kind of coat your surface with um, pencil or with marker and then work it and you'll see where the high spots are where it's grinding it off. So just keep a look at that. Just watch your scratch lines and keep looking at your scratch lines until all your scratch lines are even and you're flat. Um, there you go. Jay, Jay Tavano says bought a cheap cutting board, um, granite cutting board for like 12 bucks. That's perfect. Yeah, exactly. That's flat enough. That's what I've been doing too. It works great. Um, yeah, and glass. Glass is great. Okay. Uh, so I made, this is my first heat treated knife. I made one for myself, one for my brother-in-law, um, and it was the first time that I attempted doing a fire steel loop inside the sheath. Um, all these sheaths are the ones that I've made from as well. So that turned out pretty good. I was really happy with that. And I've been using this one for years, uh, until I made my more recent one. Um, so then again, I made, uh, I, this, this might've been the first hidden tang knife that I made. Mm, I think so. And you guys would have seen it on camera. So this, this might have been the first hidden tang. I don't, I don't remember specifically, but this might, this, I think this was my first hidden tang. So I used uh, another file. I really love this blade shape. Um, I keep going back to this blade shape. And this is what I was talking about earlier, kind of the Puko blade shape. Um, this has a little bit of a drop point, not much, just to curve down just a little bit, but mostly belly comes straight out. Um, you know, if it were just like that, that's fairly, that's a fairly simple shape. Um, I left the point on the end. I just thought it was kind of fun and made it different. Um, but I love this. It has a nice, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I have a longer saber grind. So it goes up really high, but not all the way to the top, like a full flat grind. <coughs> um, and that has, and that's actually zero ground all the way down to the edge. So there's no micro bevel. It's ground all the way. Um, there may be just the slightest convex grind on the very edge. Um, but I love this knife, brass, leather, brass, leather, uh, and this is a deer antler. I got this antler from a, um, uh, a farmer's market and it was like a couple bucks. It was actually at a stand that was for like dog chews and stuff that worked out great. Um, and a lot of people uh, don't like the fact that I ground into the antler. They'd like it to be all the rough texture, but I actually really like that transition between kind of this smooth, uh, the bone white into it. And the fact that it like transitions really smooth and cleanly from the bolster and from the spacers into that handle. Um, so I, I really like that knife. It turned out really good. And I, I love that blade shape. It's one of my favorite ever. Alan Brown asks, do I ever make knives to sell? I'll get to that, Alan. Um, <clears throat> yes, tape, yeah, Lembrini says, uh, tape your sandpaper to the flat surface. That definitely helps, because otherwise your sandpaper sliding around. Um, what leather do I use for sheaths? Uh, usually I'll use a, um, seven, eight ounce leather. So when you look at leather, you buy it in thicknesses, it's gonna have, it, it'll always be two. It's gonna say seven, eight, nine, 10, three, four, you know, five, six, something like that. So they're always going to go, they'll, they always have two numbers, at least what I've found. Uh, almost all of these are made from seven, eight ounce leather. I think this one might've been made. Yeah, this one was made from nine, 10 ounce. I got a really good deal on some nine, 10 ounce leather. So I bought that and made a couple sheaths with it. It's, it's pretty thick for sheaths. It works fine, but it's pretty thick. I've been using it for the masks for my axes. <clears throat> All right, uh, let's see. So um, I did, I did, I want to show this one. This was a cut cone knife that I actually cut down and shaped to make a marking knife for the shop. So all I did was it, all I did really was like, I transitioned this area down, um, cut the end off and then reground it to make a little marking knife for the shop. I thought that was fun. Uh, my mom found it at like a, 
a yard sale or something and the tip had been broken off. Um, so she was like, you want this? And at the time I didn't really know if I would have to do with it, but then I had it in my shop and then I wanted to make a little marking knife for woodworking and this worked great. So brought that one out. Um, so then um, I more recently showed you guys in a video um, of a circular saw making a knife from a circular saw blade. So I wanted to kind of go back and revisit what I had done in the past. Um, and I think, let's see, so I made this, right, so I did normal, I made my little bucket forge, I, for, I did all my heat treating for, and, you know, forging of this from the bucket forge, drew out that blade a little bit in the video, um, and then I uh, wanted to go back and show you guys just a tutorial on how I made a knife from a circular saw blade, so what I would have, what I would have done at the time. And that's this knife, this turned out really nice, I'm really happy with it. Um, this is uh, inspired by um, the Recluse, by Fiddleback Forge. They have a really beautiful knife that has pretty much just like a flat back all the way, a fairly simple design. Um, so obviously they don't have a bottle opener. I put that one in, I just thought that was fun to have that. Um, but that has, um, what's it, uh, Wenge handles with brass pins, no liners, just straight to the blade. But this was all made from a circular saw. Uh, this was made from a a circular saw blade that I got from a guy who did, used it on uh, cutting asphalt tiles for roofs. He worked in a roofing company, so it's like a wrecking blade. A bigger blade, and is, this is close to an eighth of an inch thick. So it's nice, It's you know, works great for my uses. Um, so I put the little you know, bottle opener. That's really easy if you're ever interested in putting a bottle opener in something. You just drill a hole, just a round hole, with your drill at whatever size you want. I think this is like a quarter inch drill. Drill the hole, and then I cut in at an angle, 45 degrees, with my um, with a um, four inch angle grinder down to the bottom of the hole and straight in from the top. And you gotta fiddle sometimes around with like getting that hook to work right, but this one worked really good. Oh yeah, there's my dog in the background. Um, so that was the circular saw blade. That one worked, turned out really well. And I kind of, I wanted, I dropped this down and made the blade a little thicker because I wanted it to kind of be a utility kind of kitchen camp knife. So. Likewise, I also wanted to be able to get to the bottle opener if I put my sheath on. I didn't want to leave the blade completely open. So I made this little sheath that's just, just covers the blade and goes at an angle. So that way, if you are using this in the camp and you need to open up a bottle of beer, you don't necessarily want to take the sheath off and have the blade exposed. You can, you can still get to that bottle opener with the sheath. So it's just a slide in sheath. And this sheath, I didn't put any, um, I didn't put any welt in between. So it's just the two pieces of leather stitched really tight. Uh, and I just be, I'm just careful what I put it in and out. So I might at some point, I might end up like cutting through the stitches, but I wanted it to fit in really well. Um, if I would have put it welted, it would have made a, made a space in between. It wouldn't have would have stayed in. So I wanted it to stay in on its own. So that was a fun little project. Um, using leather facing a fancy stitch pattern on the sheaths. All right, let me go back and read a couple questions. My summer, or a couple comments. My summer projects is make a Damascus Bowie and a bearded ax. That's awesome. I still really want to make an ax. I haven't made one yet, but. Uh, and a Damascus Bowie knife. Damascus is one of those things that I'd love to try. Um, uh, still haven't tried it yet. I thought about thinking about doing like sand mai first. So sand mai is just when you sandwich, you know, three pieces of steel together basically. So you can use you can use three pieces of high carbon steel. A lot of times people will sandwich like mild steel on the outside and a piece of high carbon in the middle. So that way you have your cutting edge in the middle. Or they'll do uh, like Jason Knight's been doing uh, stainless steel on the outside and um, and then high carbon steel in the middle. So that's really cool. Um, that's that'd be awesome. I, I also want to make a Bowie knife too, and that'll probably be a video not too, not too long down the road. Let's see. Ever thought about using leather lace and fancy stitch patterns on the sheaths? Um, I've done a couple different things with with stitching. Again, I'm I'm I usually tend to simple over more decorative. Uh, most of what I like to make and use is almost like utilitarian. So. I prefer simple over decorative. You know, something like this, 
I did have two rows of stitching. Um, so as the stitching comes up, it comes over and goes back down to add a second row there. You can see that. Um, you know, this one has, this has the, uh, the stitching on the bottom, so the flat. This is the bushcraft style sheath with the hole at the bottom to put a lanyard. It's got the stitching around and the stitching comes up and wraps back over here too. So like I'll, I'll do it a little bit more decorative when it's utilitarian. So when it's like something like that where it adds some tightness to the sheath, that's usually where I prefer to do it. I do like some things like patterns and things on the sheaths, but I don't know. I just, I like the more, just kind of leave it a little more simple and have it look clean and you know the, the craftsmanship is in the cleanliness of the pattern all right let's see Doo -doo 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 -doo. lots of 1050 tool steel can i treat that the same as 1084 quenching it in oil uh my suggestion would be for that question he says uh can you treat 1050 like 1084 uh my initial um, advice would be don't count on it uh, you never know I mean, you always want to look for the heat treat, the suggested heat treatment for that steel from a company or from an app. I have a great um, app called, um, it's called just Heat Treat, and it kind of goes through all the different 10 series, all the high carbon steels and gives you the, all the, you know, the manufacturer treatment suggestions. So I would look up what 1050, how you're supposed to heat treat it and follow the directions. Um, I do that for all the steels that I'm that I'm using, uh, 1095, 1084, 01. I just got some 80 CRV2, which I'll be making knives with. Um, and I'm just, you know, I I'm I would say just go look at the manufacturer. They're going to give you a lot more specifics than I can tell you. Um, I heat treated uh, 10 1056. I'm not exactly sure what it was, but it didn't hold an edge as hard as, hard as I wanted it to. So um, I treated it like 1084 or 1095, and it, it didn't harden as much as I wanted. So you can always test a piece. If you have a small piece of 1050, um, heat treat it and quench it the way you would do something else, and then test it afterward. Test it for, you know, for hardness. If you can get those, they sell file packs where you can get a bunch of different files that are all um, different hardnesses so you can see which scratches and which doesn't. Um, otherwise, you can test it, you know, with a file to see if it'll skate a file. After it's hardened, then it's hard. You know, it's, it's actually hardened. Um, make sure you are cleaning off any, like, forge scale on the outside. Because sometimes when you, when you test those edges, you'll, like, you'll test it with a file and it seems like it's cutting in. But it's just cutting into that forge scale on the outside. So make sure you kind of sand off that, make sure under that, and then test, test it to make sure if you've, you've um, hardened that steel. Um... <clears throat> Yeah, Sid Stone says use an angle grinder or spark test the steel. More sparks of the higher carbon. That's true. I mean, you'll get with uh, lower carbon, the, di the different amounts of carbon in the blade will spark differently. So if you just get long, even sparks that aren't really um, like fuzzy, or they're not splattering, that's going to be lower carbon. If you're getting like lots of bushy sparks and lots of bushy, um, you know, they're not super long, they kind of spray out and they're, and they're bushy and they're kind of fuzzy. That's, you know, that's the higher bits of carbon burning off. So the bushier and the sparkier it is, the higher the carbon, T generally, 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 generally. Okay. So let's see. Sadie's here. Thank you for keeping an eye on Sadie. Yes, 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 she's here right next to me under the table. She didn't go far. Uh, have you ever made a wood carving knife? Well, I mean, this is the closest thing I've made. This was designed specifically to be more of a carving knife. So a small, uh, you know, small, um, small blade with a, a long bevel. So it has like a real narrow geometry on the edge to get nice for carving. Now, ideally, you'd want something like this. You'd want something really narrow as well as sharp for wood carving. This is for marking wood. So I didn't make this. I didn't make this one, but I, I modified this down from a Cutco knife. But something like this was designed specifically to be more of like a whittling knife, carving knife. Um, ideally, you wouldn't want something so thick. This is about a quarter inch thick. You'd want to go thinner than that. But, you know, something with, it's all about the geometry on the edge. You know, you want a sh sharper knife, a thinner edge to be able to get more, more delicate cuts. All right. So um, let's see, where was I? Where was I? Oh, yeah. Electric oven for heat treating LMAX. I don't know what LMAX is. What do you think of screw on handle scales instead of permanently fixing them with pins and epoxy? Um, Max Rudder, I, my suggestion is to do both. If you're going to use like a Corby bolt, um, 
then use a Corby bolt with epoxy. I wouldn't, I mean, you can do like takedown knives and things that can be brought, taken apart, but I, I, I just don't think it's, you know, the nice thing about doing epoxy in between scales and on pins is that it kind of gives you a buffer, right? It gives you that like, there's a layer of something there that'll kind of fill in all the gaps, makes everything smooth so you don't get any wobble, you get a little bit of play on the edge so then when you get the squeeze out, you can wipe it off, it's filled all those gaps, you can't see any gaps between your blade and your tang. I always use epoxy and then, you know, if I was using Corby bolts, which I actually just bought some Corby bolts for some new knives that I'll be making, um, you know, that my intention is to do them, epoxy everything up, screw them all together, tighten it down, wipe out all the glue out, and use them at the same time. Morning from Australia. Gary Boucher, good to see you. Good morning. Omar Morsi, thanks for the info, no problem. Kelly Wright, I'm impressed. Thank you for sharing your talent. Thank you, Kelly. Appreciate that. Max Rudder, no problem. Okay, um, so this was my first attempt at a forged blade other than this. I did draw this out some. You guys watched the video for this one. Uh, I worked on this. I, I drew it out. Basically, I just you know, hammered it to be able to stretch it some more. I wanted it a little bit longer. It was a little shorter. I probably drew it about a half an inch, so probably brought it out, but you know, it was already basically shaped to where I wanted it, so I just made it a little longer. This one I forged completely um, from a piece of a pickaxe. I actually cut off the, the, the point of a pickaxe and used that um, and made this. So this is a what's called a blacksmith knife. Usually a blacksmith's knife is all metal, has the metal handle. It's not very long, but I drew out, you know, drew out a long tang, worked on doing a little, some scroll, brought it back around in and ground it down. Um, I did a little bit of grinding on the top. This, I didn't get the shape very well on my first attempt. Um, it was a little chunky, but I did kind of draw it out. Uh, and I'm pretty happy with that. I just keep this in the shop. I hang it up. It's a nice little shop knife and it holds a pretty decent edge. So that was my first uh, fully forged knife that I made uh, out of, you know, a chunk of steel that wasn't already in a, you know, flat bar stock shape. Other than that, I haven't done a lot of forging. Um, so then I did my uh, Ray Mears copy. So this is based off the wood lore knife. So for this knife specifically, I went online, I found the wood lore um, knife shape, and I printed it out to scale that I wanted. And then I just traced that directly on a piece of paper and then made this knife. So I really, I like that shape and that design and wanted to make one for myself. This is using O1 tool steel, which is usually um, what they were made out of as well. Same handle shape with the Coke bottle handle, uh, the flat Ricasso area, and a little bit of a nub here where you, where your like, you know, finger goes around um, two brass pins that are a quarter inch and then a quarter inch lanyard tube, all brass. And that was made out of, um, I have actually black and glow in the dark liners, which is really cool. That was a fun, a fun uh, knife to make. <clears throat> and, and it's a uh, walnut. It's actually like walnut right up close to uh, a knot. So I got these like really beautiful, you know, green and kind of, texture in the walnut. Uh, that has a Scandi grind um, and that worked out really well. I'm really happy with that knife and this is now my go-to backpacking knife. At the same time I made um, the fire steel and did my handle in the same way. So it's the black walnut and the glow in the dark and black liners. And if you guys watch this video you'll know that I drilled through to make sure everything would stay together really well and then ended up when I shaped it down it you know, I shaped into those pins, those epoxy pins, which I wasn't happy with at the time. But what are you gonna do? Um, and this one has a dangler. I actually really like the dangler. I wasn't 100% sure and I put it on there um, with the intention that, you know, I knew that I could kind of put this dangler loop down if I didn't want to use it and just run my belt through. But I've been really happy with the dangler. I like the way it holds. I like the way it hangs down. I can move it around when I sit down and stuff. Um, and I can tie it to my knee if I, if I need to or tie it to my leg, which I haven't done yet, but um, I found I've been really happy with it. I really like the way Dangler works. Let's see. All right. So who we got? Um, press. Thanks. What's up from Peoria, Illinois? HBK Styles. How's it going? Uh, Omar Morsi says I got some 1084 and want to make a full tang EDC knife. 
Would you have a design that you feel works well for full tang? I do lots of fishing and camping. Thanks again. Uh, <clears throat> I, my, again, my, my go-to knife style is a drop point. Um, I really like a uh, drop point for kind of all around use. So again, this uh, with the, um, <clears throat> the Ray Mears wood lure style knife, you know, this has a drop point. I mean, this is pretty much like a full even taper down to one point. So you get this kind of spear point, um, which, you know, gives you a lot of strength and you, you know, it's nice and even in the middle so you can kind of bore with it if you need to. Um, but something <clears throat> with a drop point, I think works well. Something with a nice belly to it, um, you know, this has, again, I really like this, has a drop, the drop comes down. So drop point is where the, the spine comes down to your point. This has a nice belly, so it'd be able to, really good for like filleting and getting in there. You could do a lot of stuff with the belly. <clears throat> um, and, you know, I would say, so drop point, um, something with, you know, decent thickness so you can get some belly to it. Um, and... You know, if you're gonna do, let's see, you said lots of fishing and camping. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, pretty much any handle style. Uh, I usually prefer something that's not super, like I don't like to have a lot of finger grooves. You know, something like this is what I prefer for a handle shape. Um, it just gives you like a nice, you know, a, a nice belly in the middle to kind of grip onto and wrap your hand around. Um, but also, you know, if you need to flip it over and you're kind of chipping away at something, it works well the other way as well. So you're not kind of, if you have like a finger groove, then sometimes those finger grooves can kind of get in the way. If you need to turn your knife around and pull it toward yourself, you know, you don't want something sticking into your palm. So I usually try to do a handle that feels good in all different ways. So if you're making a handle, think about that. Think about holding it multiple different ways. Um, and actually that, let me, um, I'll get to it in a minute, but that leads me into the reason why I have these two wooden prototype knives here, and I'll talk about that. Um, let's see. So Doug Miller says, shout out to Devin for his great videoing on your knife projects. I agree 100%. I could not do this channel without Devin. He does an awesome job and makes it look beautiful. So thank you for shouting him out. Um, afternoon, Article 4, Section 4, how's it going? Uh, Walter Waller says, do I prefer larger diameter pins for aesthetics or stability? Um, I, uh, I would say <clears throat> I like the look of, I, I think it kind of just more depends on the knife. So I think sometimes, you know, a knife looks nicer with smaller pins. Sometimes it looks nicer with larger pins. So this one, you know, this is the wood lure, has the quarter inch pins. I like the look of that. If I'm doing something with like two pins, I might go with a bigger pin, um, you know, but something here, you know, using a one eighth inch pin, I think that just looks nice in this handle. Three little thin pins. So I think it's more of a design thing. I don't think it's really um, a utility thing all that much. I think smaller pins or larger pins, as long as you're using, you know, enough to be stable, then you can use both. A lot of times, you know, if you look at custom knife makers, you'll see them using both in one handle. They might have a large pin at the end and a, you know, a lanyard tube, and then maybe three small pins at the front. So it's really all like decorative, you know, you want to get something stable in there that kind of, again, goes all the way from one handle scale through the tang and into the other handle scale. But as long as you have those and you're good to go. <clears throat> Any recurve S-shaped blade planned? Um, <clears throat> not so much. Um, I might, I'm, I'm thinking about doing a Bowie knife and that might have a little bit of a recurve in it. Maybe not, we'll see. I don't know. Again, that's, I'm, I'm just not a big fan of them. You know, if it's something where I would do maybe one, if like, um, if I had, you know, someone who commissioned me to make something like that, but it's also pretty tricky if you're doing, if you're grinding, um, you know, a, an outward bend in a knife. So as your bend turns this way, as you're grinding, you can kind of turn your blade like this. And your blade, your grinder will run straight up and down and it'll run like this. If you are doing an inside curve like that, it's, it's harder to keep the, uh, the bevels even in my experience. And I've tried before and haven't been really happy with it. So... I also am just not a big fan of, you know, knives like that. I like, again, I like utilitarian knives. I like knives that serve a good purpose and can be used in the real world. You know, something like a big Bowie knife, it's not something you're going to use in the real world. I mean, unless you are planning on, you know, 
going out and living in the wilderness by yourself for, you know, more amount of time than, you know, it takes to whatever, grow a tree. <laughs> then you might want a big knife or, you know, if the apocalypse were to happen, I'd want a big knife and I have a nice big knife that I would put on my belt and I'd take that with me because it's gonna definitely gonna scare some people away if you have a big knife on your belt. But um, in the real world with what happens, you know, I, I've found that I had, don't really need anything bigger than maybe four inches. Three and a half to four inches is like, does everything I need to do when I'm camping and backpacking and using a knife around. I mean, my everyday carry knife is a Leatherman Skeletal, you know, and this has like a three inch blade on it. It does everything I need it to do every day. I, you know, like if I'm just walking around my property, I'll sharpen sticks with it. I'll, I'll make marshmallow sticks. I'll cut down, you know, I can cut down like an inch thick or inch and a half thick branch if I need to do something, you know, with just using this and it works. But for camping and backpacking, I like to have a fixed blade and I like to have something around that three and a half to four to four and a half inch range. <clears throat> Okay, about your pain. What's your opinion on O1 tool steel as a beginner steel as any good quality? O1 is great quality. Um, you know, it's it, it depends on the beginner. So if you're a beginner and you have the ability to, so if you're gonna try to do everything yourself, if you're gonna try to heat treat your blade, um, do all the tempering and heat treating and shaping all on your own, um, and you're a beginner and you don't have the tools, my suggestion would be to use something easier like 1084. Um, I, I use 1095 to start with and that worked well. Um, because they have a wider range um, that you can get a good quality hardening in. So with like something like 1084, 1095, um, you can do it in a forge. Like I've done all my heat treating in a forge because I've kind of looked at it. I did O1 in the forge as well, but I was really careful with that when I really tried to keep it. Um, I did like several, you know, I did an extra, I think I did two extra normalizing cycles, um, tried them at different heats, read a lot about it, and then did all my heat treating like really carefully to try to get everything look really, really even and clean. Like, you know, nice bright red, not, not too orange, not too dull red, somewhere in the middle. So it just took some more time but I'd learned my forge, I'd learned how to use it pretty well. So I was able to kind of, you know, modify and moderate that temperature well to get it to heat treat well. And it did, it hardened well and it worked well. And I like O1 and it's a great steel on you and there are lots of makers that use O1. Um, but if you're a beginner, you know, something like 1084 or 1095, um, you know, has a little bit more range to it. So you can get it in the forge. If it's a little too hot and you quench it, it's gonna harden pretty well. If it's a little bit little too cold, you quench it, it's gonna harden pretty well. Um, so that's why a lot of people use them. And, and it's not that it's like a lesser quality steel because some of the best knife makers in the world still use 1094 and 1095 and 01 and 80 V2 and all sorts of steels, you know, for different projects. So it just depends on what you wanna use it for. And, and the ability of what your, um, <clears throat> let's see, the ability of what you can afford. So if you're a beginner and you have some money to buy some stuff and you buy a heat treating oven, then it doesn't really matter. You can do whatever you want because you can set those, those uh, temperatures and you can follow the directions of the manufacturer to heat treat those knives exactly, which is kind of what, it, you know, what it's about. So if you're a beginner and you only have access to, say, a propane torch, then it's gonna be a little trickier. You might wanna do a small knife like this because you could probably heat up a small knife with a propane torch and get it to that nice cherry red, you know, a little bit, maybe a little bit orange, cherry red and quench it and you'd be good to go or just work your edge. Um, let's see. Hi from Manchester, Mark Croft. Good to see you from the UK. Uh, Tony Perta, Parada, Tony Parada. Tony, if you have video issues, refresh your browser or app, you should be good. Okay. All right, so let's see. So um, my next knife that I made, which is a little more recently, I made the bone handle knife for my daughter. She's been using it, so it's got a little bit of patina to it. But this was made out of um, a white-tailed deer leg bone that we found together. Um, I cut it down, which was pretty tricky to get enough material out of a leg bone from white tail tear, but I was able to get enough to do thin scales. So I have black liners, which are eighth of an inch thick, and then probably about another three sixteenths or something of uh, the bone on either side with two pins, one on either end. And that, you know, for this one, I use two pins because it's a small handle. This handle is probably like three and a half inches. Um, and then the blade is like 
two and a half to three inches. It's a great little knife. Um, I actually got inspiration for this knife from um, a knife maker on YouTube, on uh, Instagram called Gallardo Knives, and he makes a really cool knife called the Atom, and that's where I got my inspiration to make this knife from. So it's a great little knife. Um, has, again, like a saber grind, so a higher grind here, um, and just like a nice even point, little choil there, similar. Nice and just simple knife and made the sheath for her. Almost lost it, fell out. Of, she was using it to uh, find some like uh, forge, a little bit of like uh, Johnny jump ups and lemongrass and things around to make a little salad from our lawn and it fell out of her basket. Um, and so we had to go and we had to look for it, but we found it, so all was well. But this turned out really nice. I love this little knife and I love the look of the antler and bone on a handle. All right, so um, next knife I made more recently was my the bigger chef's knife. So this knife I actually started uh, maybe two years ago. So I was at a um, went to a forging class at a place called the Foundry, which no longer exists in Baltimore, but I took a class at the Foundry on making nails, doing some forging, did that and then went back and I had a leaf spring from my brother's Jeep Cherokee, uh, which might have been 1054 or 5160, I'm not exactly sure. Um, but I forged this blade out pretty much all to shape. I didn't shape this part at the time. I didn't know exactly the handle shape I wanted. So I basically just worked on the on the tip. So that was pretty much forged to shape and thickness and then it was just straight back. So then I brought it home later and made my hand out of it. But this is a uh, handle made of Bubinga and black liners. Um, high carbon steel. You can see it's patinaed some but you know I like that. I like the patina on it. Um, you know I just I'm careful with it. It doesn't hold a great edge. So that's why I'm not 100% sure if it heat treated well. Um, it, I can sharpen it really well, but it doesn't hold a very, an edge very long. Um, so I just kind of keep sharpening it and I'll learn from this one and on my next one. Um, and so actually this is one I'm working on now. So this is my next blade I'm working on. This is another chef's knife that I'm working on. Um, this is made from the same steel, so I'm gonna, gonna check it a little bit and practice with this one. Um, I tried a new technique on this, which I learned from, um, I learned from, <laughs> sorry, my wife is distracting me. She just got home from work and she's popping up on me. Hello. Hello. Hey, all right, cool. I'll open that up. Um, so uh, Andreas Kalani um, did a quick video for uh, combat abrasives where he talked about finding your center line you know marking your center on your blade and then grinding like a 45 degree angle basically down to that center um, leaving a little bit of thickness on that edge so you already have your center line so that way when I do my grind later I'm going to do a full flat grind on this get it all the way out and I'll do a distal taper which is from the ricasso all the way down to the tip it'll get thinner as it goes out um, with that, it'll, that'll be ground all the way, but you know, with that, that way I already have my center line. I don't have to worry about keeping the center and going back and looking at it and marking that and kind of looking at those thin lines. I already have it here so I can do all my grinding straight with that. Um, so that, you know, that was inspired by all sorts of different makers on Instagram, uh, Mareko Mamasi, who does really beautiful chef's knives. You know, this is kind of a little bit inspired by him, a little bit inspired by Jay Lee's knives, um, you know, uh, Hazenberg knives is really beautiful knives. All of them, they kind of have uh, not a similar style exactly, but all those things I took as inspiration for my next one. Um, so that's what this is going to be. So I like this kind of handle with the, like the bump in the middle, you know, and kind of, you have this, uh, the heel of the blade here, which comes back. So you can kind of get your fingers and really do like not like a lot of like nice rocking motion when you're cutting, good pinch grip. You know, if you need to do some chopping, it'll have some weight to it as well. But this will have a tapered tang, which I also did a taper at the end, and I don't know if you guys can see that, but I'm working on my taper, you know, ground down to the 
thinness that I want on that. So it'll have a taper tang and a distal taper. I'm hoping that should look really nice. So it's actually gonna taper from the Ricasso, Ricasso to the tip and from the Ricasso to the end of the handle. This is my next one I'm working on. So uh, I just have to start grinding that. <clears throat> uh, I finished this little knife. This was uh, a little knife for my nephew um, who passed his whittling, got his whittling badge in Boy Scouts, which we do here in the States. Um, so I was commissioned to make this knife for him by uh, my sister-in-law's sister. So his, his aunt on the other side uh, wanted me to make this for him. So I made this, um, I still have to make the sheath for it, but this is Bubinga handle, um, brass bolster and a brass end cap with brass liners in the middle, uh, wenge in the middle and then leather. So it's brass and leather brass, wenge spacer, brass leather, bakodi, and then brass on the end. And I actually uh, screwed in. So this is actually screwed in from the end into the wood to add some extra strength. But it's a hidden tang, uh, an old Nicholson file, and I left some of the markings on it. I like that look again with, you know, kind of just the Puko style handle, fairly similar, fairly simple, I mean, but really pretty little knife. So I'm excited to give that to him. Uh, black liners, you're talking about, so, okay. So Alan, Alan Brown asked me what I'm using for my black liner. So for this liner, you're talking about, this is leather spacers. These black liners, I actually use a sign making material. Um, it's a light fast acrylic designed for signs um, that I get from a local sign shop and I get scraps and things left, uh, left over from their, their sign, little pieces and things that'll work fine for me. Um, and that works really well. Um, I mean, there's like G10 and micarta and all sorts of different things that you can use um, for liners. Um, these work really well and really kind of serve the purpose that I want, which is more decorative. I'll kind of scrape them and scuff them up so I get lots of like nice texture and I'll drill through them so I have plenty of material and where the, the epoxy can go all the way through. Um, all right, so we've gotten to some of my newer things that I'm making. So this is a little knife that I'm still working on. Um, this, I was in, actually inspired by Jeremy from A Simple Little Life. He did a video where he made like a little, uh, just like a little utility knife for the shop. I had a piece of, I think this is 01, if I remember correctly. Might be 01, might be, yeah, I think it's 01. So a little piece of 01 that I had left over and it was like five inches, so not really enough to make a knife out of, unless I want to make a hidden tang knife out of it. I wasn't sure, it's kind of been sitting around the shop. So I decided to make like a little utility knife out of it, really similar to the style and shape that uh, Jeremy from A Simple Little Life made his. And I did some file work on the tang, which you may or may not be able to see there. Let's see, Let me go that way. See it better on that side? Oh. Yeah, it's not very clear, but some file work on the Tang. Um, and the cool thing about this, I was playing around with uh, deciding if I wanted to do like a stone wash or something. I wanted to do some type of surface treatment to this, just to try something different, because I'm not going to put a handle on it. I'm not going to drill any holes. I'm just going to leave it as a little thin knife, you know, just like that, exactly the way it is. Um, so I did my heat treatment. And after taking it out of the temper, of, to temper, I, I'm just tempering in my kitchen oven. Um, I put it in for 200 degrees, for uh, 400 degrees for two hours, 400 degrees Fahrenheit um, for two hours. And I took it out after the first tempering cycle. And it had, you know, it had the kind of straw, straw brown that I wanted. So I was really happy with the temper. I'm like, that's great. Um, and then I was waiting for the... Uh, I was waiting for it to cool down so I could reheat treat it, uh, retemper it, sorry. And I started to like the look of the temper color. I was like, how cool is that, right? It has this great straw color to it. Um, so I put it back in for the se second cycle, ran it, you know, it came out really nice. Just a little red in the blade, which is okay, because, you know, this is just for around the shop. Not really red, just a little bit, you know, a little warmer, a little bit to the redder side of that straw color where it got thin. Um, but I'm really happy with this. I really like the look and the color of this. I think it's just like, it looks so great. I love this, you know, the color of the heat treat. And I know there are some um, knife makers that'll leave the heat treat color on their blades sometimes. I've seen Jeff Fader do some stuff on his. Um, 
And so I haven't actually done my final sharpening, but this is pretty much ground all the way down to almost a zero grind before I did my heat treat. Uh, I got a little teeny warp right at the tip. It's turning, but not so much, not enough, you know, for something like this, which is for me for in the shop, it's going to work perfectly. So this is really fun. That was one that I just did recently. Um, and so that kind of brings me to uh, my next knife and what I'm planning on doing. So I just made, just put an order. I got a bunch of 80 CRV2, uh, inch and a half by one eighth inch. Um, and I'm gonna be making uh, a new knife. So I'm gonna do this on the video. Um, and I wanna make a, a Puko style knife. You know, like a fairly simple knife. Again, I keep going back to the more and more simple styles. So this is my prototype. Um, this was my first prototype. I did some sketches and drawings of what I thought I wanted to do. Um, so this is an inch wide at the Ricasso. Um, it, it drops down one eighth of an inch from the flat of the spine. So it comes out, drops down one eighth of an inch. Um, you know, this is a three and a half inch blade, about halfway your belly starts, flat spine here. Um, the blade is flat all the way across the bottom to all the way at the end of the handle. And then the handle up top, it's flat across the top about halfway and then it tapers down one eighth of an inch at the back. And then the back is whatever thickness it is. And then it's just a, uh, we just have, you know, an octagonal handle, which I really like. Um, you know, at first I just ground these. I was thinking, you know, I want to make a prototype. I wanted to make an outline of the blade that I liked and I thought it'd be cool to make something and have it there. That way I could kind of work off of that template. So I made my shape of the wooden knife and I made it out of, you know, whatever this is, three quarter inch, just, you know, standard lumber that I had a piece of oak. Um, cut it out, traced it, so I have my original, um, my original template, and then I ground down to actually have like the blade shape, you know, to really get, a ha get the feel of it. Um, this has a four inch handle and a three and a half inch blade. So I was thinking it'd be nice, just a small knife, something that would fit into a rel relatively small sheath. So something like this, you know, I think it'll probably fit into something like this fairly well. Obviously it's not in all the way, it's still into about here, but you know, relatively small sheath, something that um, doesn't take up much room, can kind of be on your belt, but pretty small. Small knife to be an EDC if you wanted to wear something like this, but also big enough, you know, to do pretty much everything that I would need it to do for bushcrafting. I mean, the only thing that this wouldn't do that something, you know, even like this, which is really thick and heavy, this like four and a half inch blade, you know, I might be able to use this to chop through a tree that's, you know, upwards of three inches in diameter. You know, you're not really gonna do that with this. Now, obviously you could do it with this, it's gonna take a lot more time. Something that's heavier and longer blade, you're gonna be able to kind of chop through some stuff and use it as a chopper. You know, anything like this is gonna be used for pretty much a normal knife use. Um, so, I made this template. I really like it. Um, I gave it to my wife. And I wanted her to feel. I gave it to my daughter, just to everybody to feel. I kind of wanted it to be a general purpose, good for men and women. Um, and I was really happy with it. But you know, the more I held it, and the more I looked at it, I just thought it's just the handle's a little too thin. And my wife was using it, and she said, you know, if I'm if I'm holding it like this, you know, then the end of the handle kind of stick into my hand a little bit. You know, she gave me some good feedback on it. So. I thought, okay, well, I'll add a quarter inch and see what I like. So then I made the second. So this is my second prototype. Same thing, all the same dimensions, except for the handle is a quarter inch longer. So this comes out two inches flat, tapers down to an, down an eighth of an inch, two and a half inches to the end. So you have a four or two and a quarter. So you have a four and a quarter inch handle. I added that quarter on, still the same exact blade type, octagonal handle. Um, ground it, and just that difference made a huge difference. I mean, I think it looks much better aesthetically. Like it looks, it looks better. It fits much better in my hand. You know, four and a quarter fills my hand completely. I have fairly big hands, you know, but that fills my hand completely without being too big. You know, even something like the Woodlore clone. When I hold that, you know, this comes out about another quarter an inch past my hand. I'm holding this one. You know, it's pretty much right on. So that four and a quarter was just right. Just uh, just big enough to fit my hand right, but not so big that it's more than I needed to be. I wanted to be able to keep it as small and simple as possible and do all the things I wanted to do. 
So, uh, so this is my prototype for a new knife I'm gonna make. Now I'm gonna shoot a video of making this knife. I'm gonna make it out of, like I said, 80 CRV2. Um, I'll probably do 1 8 inch liners on either side of the blade and some type of handle material. Uh, and then I'm gonna live with that for a little while. I'm gonna live with it, I'm gonna test it out and see what I like, and I'll probably test it. I'll keep you guys up to date. I'll put some information up on Instagram of my test of it, see how it works, see how it feels. Uh, and then if I like it, which I think I'm going to because I really, really love these prototypes. It's just got a little bit of a swell in the middle. It actually goes across the spine, which I think is kind of fun. A little bit different design, so it, you know the bottom is completely flat and the spine has a little lift in the middle to fill out your palm. You know, swell just a little bit in the middle, but not too much. Uh, if I really like this, then I think I'm going to make a run of six or seven of these. And I'll probably put a post on YouTube community and put a post on Instagram and Facebook and reach out to some people who I know have been asking um, over the years and more recently. Some people I know that want to buy knives from me and some of you who've asked in the past about buying knives. Um, I did see that somebody asked about an electro etching. What about electro etching so you can um, do my signature? I am going to do that as well. Uh, there's a few different ways to do that. I have um, uh, somebody, a friend of mine who has a, um, what's it called? A, uh, a linoleum cutter machine, I guess, or like a you know nylon cutting machine. So um, he can cut out my templates for me for my the Art of Craftsmanship design, which will be the, the AOC with the mountaintop with the snow on it. Um, and I'll be doing that on these blades. So I'll definitely try that on this one. That I'm hoping that'll make it into the video. We'll see. Um, but I'm really excited to try that out, make a new knife, um, do something that, um, you know, I can give to, I can put out there and maybe sell some and see how it goes. And if, you know, if I really like it and it goes really well, I may, might make a line, a line of more of them. Kind of the art of craftsmanship knife. Um, Theo Kleiman just asked how much will it cost. Um, my goal right now is to have it um, the knife and the sheath for two hundred dollars. So I think you know I've um, you know I made knives long enough. I've done some knives over the years for commission, but not really sold many. Um, you know I think as for me as a knife maker, I would feel comfortable with the amount of time and effort and you know individual care of each knife that I make. Um, that you know to this point I haven't really done anything like that for sale because it's not really worth my time. Um, as a, I have a full-time job as a teacher, I shoot the videos on a lot of the evenings, you know, nights and things, and, and just the amount of time that would take to put into something, it just doesn't make it cost effective for me um, and my time, you know, where I have, you know, my work time and my school time, uh, you know, and the video time for the channel, and then I want to spend time with my family. So if I have to put extra time into making a bunch of knives and things to sell, it's not really cost effective. So um, $200 to me seems fair for a custom knife um, from you know a maker that you know that I'll put my time and effort, I'll put 100% of my craftsmanship into it and you'll get the best you know, tool that you can get. Um, you know, obviously I'll test all my things for hardness to make sure they hold an edge. Um, and then you know, I'll, I'll be doing my test for this knife. Uh, and hopefully in the not too distant future, I'll be getting a heat treating oven as well. Um, which will be fun. So I'll be able to actually do everything really, really solidly um, in my heat treating oven to really get, get really good um, outcome for heat treating my blades. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of, you know, I've got, I'm giving you guys the like the rundown of my years as a knife maker back from when I was in college, probably like 2002 when I first started making knives, getting interested into it up until like these I made last weekend for like the prototype for the next blade. Um, everything, you know, this year you guys seen it in videos, things like that. Um, so you know, I, I really appreciate you guys watching and being here. I've seen like, there's been up, you know, 70, 80 people watching the whole time. That's really great. I really appreciate it. I love chatting with you guys. Um, I want to do more, you know, more, you know, more live streams. And sometimes, you know, I get busy and we get busy. Um, but uh, I really appreciate everything you guys have done and your support for the channel and your comments and your questions and your watching. It's been really fun. You know, I only drank one beer. It's been an hour and 20 minutes. Not too bad. Mm. But as my wife pulled up, she came around the corner and she was holding 
something. This will be the last thing I'm gonna do on the live stream today. She was holding a package. Now in this package, this is from, uh, this is from Brian House, the channel House Made. Hello, Eric from North Carolina. Um, and if you guys follow Brian House, you definitely go check him out on his YouTube channel, uh, Housework. Um, also, you can you know check him out on Instagram uh, and Facebook. But he does a really awesome channel. He's a super good guy. Uh, my he made my grinder for me, which is just beautiful, and I can't thank him enough. Um, if you've been following along with him, he's been making, uh, he's been doing some um, stabilizing for wood handles. So I reached out to him and you know asked him if we could do something with stabilizing and if I could get some pieces from him to make some handles. Um, I actually want to put some stabilized wood on this as a kitchen knife handle because kitchen knife handles obviously they're going to get into water a lot more often than something like you know a bushcraft or an outdoor knife you know you can kind of avoid water with these or at least often but something like a kitchen knife you're going to be using it and cleaning it all the time you know and i'm super paranoid about this knife you know i i use it and wash it and dry it you know i, I try not to get too much water on the handle at all i re re-oil the handle often and just keep it really dry so i want to use and this is not stabilized wood it's just regular babingo which is an exotic wood so it has some oils in it so it's okay um so uh brian's been doing some stabilizing so he sent me some uh um sent me some stabilized wood so i'm super super happy with that um so you get a little unboxing. So Brian sent this. He put a letter in here. He says, Dustin and Sean. So it's a buddy of mine up here. I didn't have time to sand off the resin, but I figured you all have the tools for that. Three sets of book matched curly maple stabilized in black resin, resin baked to perfection. Much love to you guys and your family. Stay well. Keep on making. Brian House, thank you so much. Um, I really, really appreciate it. So he sent me up. Um, Let's see. So you didn't have a chance to. I'm gonna open up just one of these. Uh, we will, we'll see. I'm gonna open up one and I'll show you guys. So you say you didn't get you a chance to sand off all the resin, but that's fine. We can do that. So this is stabilized curly maple, um, stabilized in black resin. So once you grind down into this, you'll get like, we'll get a really nice, um, get like a great variety of grain, some light, some dark and black. So there you go. Obviously it's got a lot of resin on it, so you can't really see, you know, something like this. Um, I'll use pieces like this to use my handle scales. It's going to be more than enough. Um, I'm super happy with this. Thank you so much, Brian. Oh, there he is. Good. Glad to see he just got here. And it's fun to be able to get him just in time to be able to open on the video. Um, he sent me up three sets for myself and a buddy of mine up here. We can't thank you enough. We'll definitely uh, buy you that round or two when you come up to visit. Um, but I really appreciate it. Um, so thank you guys for watching. It's been fun today. Can't see it in the camera. Devin. <laughs> Devin called me. Oh. Um, but yeah, again, thank you so much, uh, Brian, for sending them. That's been great. Um, he's been getting a knife making too, which is really fun to see him doing that. And we, we kind of uh, became friends through YouTube. He was following along with my, uh, my knife making build recently where I build, did my build along with uh, the Knife Talk podcast guys for their video. And I don't have that one here because that was a knife for my brother and he's got that one on the other end. So thank you guys so much for watching. It's been fun today. It's been fun hanging out with you. Really appreciate the comments. Really appreciate um, everyone's support and hanging out with me today. And uh, other than that, thank you guys for watching. And if you have any comments or questions, I'll post this so it will be live. You can write me questions there or comments and I'll definitely respond to them and reply. If there's anything I talked about that you wanna see like more specifically, just let me know in the comments on the video and I can post up some pictures on Instagram um, of some of the other stuff, maybe talk a little bit about, um, you know, more things about what I did along the way and give you guys some tips. You can also always send me a message or DM on Instagram or Facebook or um, YouTube. And then you can also always email me at 
uh, theartofcraftsmanship at gmail.com. So thanks guys so much, and hope you enjoyed today's live stream, and we'll see you guys next time. Cheers.